Welcome to The Weekly, a podcast brought to you by Calvary Bible Church. I'm your host, Jay Ewing. I usually reside on the Erie campus most often, but we love what's happening in all three campuses here at Calvary. Talking about that today, we have someone new in the booth with me today, a little surprise. I got Solomon Mochapal. He's here. He's thanks, here. For ha- thanks for having me, Jay. I'm honored. Yeah, man. It's so good to have you. He resides on the Erie campus usually too in student ministry, although he works with all the students across all the campuses, especially on big events. Yeah, that's, r- that's right. And we actually have our big one coming up this spring break, so we're going on our, on our big Ironman trip. Man, you're segueing already before me. I mean, that's just our next big trip that's happening. Get to <laughs> hang out with, with all three campuses. That's right, man. Iron Man is happening. You want to go to CalvaryBible.com, click events, click your campus, sign up for Iron Man. If you're a parent of a high schooler, you don't want them to miss this trip. Spring break. It's a wonderful trip. It has been going for how many years? How many years is Iron Man? 25, I, I 27? Oh, I, uh, definitely mid twenties, but yeah, famous trip that Gary started. It'll actually be my first year, but I'm told by everyone that this is the best trip for us to go on. Yeah. So I'm excited. Yeah, man, Iron Man. I've been on Iron Man before. No way. Yeah, uh, Gary brought me in about seven years ago to speak one night at Iron Man, and it snowed in Colorado, and so I got stuck in California and had to go to the beach with all the high schoolers for one wow. day. Wow, I how, suffered. Ter- how terrible. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it, like, it really snowed, and my flight got canceled for the day, so I just hung out with high schoolers. That's sweet. That's yeah, awesome. man. Gary and I t- tore it up in uh, spike ball on the beach with the high schoolers, man. No way. You were playing spike ball seven years ago? Yeah. yeah. Wow. On the beach <laughs> in California on spring break. Yes, while everyone was suffering through the cold. It was great. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Yeah, uh, I love Iron Man. It's such a great event. Man, you know, why the name Iron Man? Do you know? I, I think, so I, I mean, I was not there when, when it was named. Yes. But I I think it comes from the passage in Proverbs talks about uh, as iron sharpens iron, one man sharpens another. Yeah. That I think that's probably where yeah. that, that the name comes from. And sort of the theme of Iron Man as well is sort of the spiritual disciplines. You engage, high schoolers engage in some intentional disciplines through that week to really get in their their bags to take into their, their everyday life, right? Totally, yeah. My, my impression is it's, it's probably, we borrow from that verse, but also it's a spiritual form of when you think about someone doing like a physical Iron Man, mm-hmm. like the, the big race or big um, physical event that people do that right. they call an Iron Man, uh, that we are trying to create that spiritual intensity, uh, spiritual growth, spiritual stretching on this trip. And so, I mean, I, I've just heard so many stories of, I mean, Gary does did all-nighters, they did prayer, like mm-hmm. prayer through the night. They like, He kept them awake all night long. And yep. so there's there's been a little bit of changes, but that's, definitely what we're trying to do and accomplish and really stretch students as yeah. they grow man that's awesome so good um yeah actually for those who don't know at calvary and i think it's really interesting we do they do a senior trip post iron man so most of the everyone else goes home on the buses the seniors engage in a senior trip yep and it is a secret like you once you get on the senior trip you pledge your fidelity never to reveal what you did on the senior trip it's true yeah i i'm going and i still don't know exactly yet yeah we're good what we're doing so for eight years well seven and a half years that i've been on staff i've tried to figure out what senior trip is and does and it's sort of a running joke that i still don't know and i'm like desperately trying to discover what happens chris barnes who's been here for i think 12 years now Mm -hmm. still does not know what happened that senior trip yeah and they have a facebook page where the the graduates of the senior trip get to watch the seniors go on the trip so Mm -hmm. it's a very exclusive club that you want your senior to be a part of exactly yep so if you have a senior this is a great trip just to to send them on uh iron man just so that they can be on senior trip yeah uh it's really funny. Gary, I always try to ask Gary little tidbits, and he knows what I'm doing. I'm fishing for <laughs> information <laughs> on senior trip. It's really funny. Every year I get reminded on Iron Man that I do not know what happens on senior trip, and so I have to go on it. Like someday I'll have to take the seniors on senior trip yeah. so I know what's going on. Yeah. 
I mean, you could just be a small group leader. <laughs> <laughs> I could be a small group leader. All right, so that's really fun, Solomon. I'm, I'm so glad you're in the booth. Tell us a little more about yourself. How long have you been on staff? Where did you come from? How long have you been married? We know you have a great wife, Kelsey, and, you know, just share a little bit so that those at Calvary, maybe on the other campuses, don't who don't know you can get to know you. Yeah, totally. So my wife's name is Kelsey. We moved out to Colorado about a, just over a year ago now, maybe a year, two, three months from Chicago. We graduated from the Moody Bible Institute, and we moved out here because of Calvary, mm-hmm. because we felt like God had really, I mean, one of my best friends introduced us to the church, and we came out here, and we fell in love with Calvary, and just felt like God had really placed Calvary Bible Church in Colorado on our hearts, and we were like, yeah, this is where we think God wants us to go, and, you know, there was that sp- the, a spot open in the student ministry, and I, I've just been in, been so encouraged and so welcomed, and it's been so cool to see the ways God is working at Calvary and getting to be a part of that Um in the middle school ministry a little bit last year, and then this year stepping into the high school ministry and just getting to serve and pour. Um, I mean, Kelsey and I have loved right now. We help to oversee the freshmen. So I lead the freshman boys. She leads freshman girls. It's been awesome to partner together and to watch God work in a new class Mm -hmm. of high schoolers. Yeah. So yeah, we, we came out here from Chicago, but Colorado has been really cool. Yeah. That's really cool, man. So what did you study at Moody? What was sort of your emphasis? Yeah, so I actually got, I started my degree when I started college was pastoral ministry. And then in conversations with other upperclassmen and really discerning and wrestling through what God was calling me to do and what I was wrestling with. I mean, an upperclassman told me my first semester, you should join the biblical preaching major or the biblical exposition major. And so I switched midway through my freshman year and I actually studied preaching in my undergrad. Yeah. For those who don't know, you also actually have another podcast. Podcast is nothing new to you. You and uh, well, Jake and you, Jake who resides on the Boulder campus have a preaching podcast. Uh, That that is true. Yeah. We started a preaching podcast our senior year at Moody. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were just having conversations all the time together And then with our professors, and we were like, we should just create a space where we just do this all the time. And then we just haven't stopped. Yeah. Not to throw our wives under a bus, but we have something in common. Both of our wives don't listen to our podcast. It's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you tell me the story. It was really funny. Yeah, my wife, I mean, she's told this to me multiple times, but she's like, I I don't listen to you you and Jake's podcast because it's just like if I, it's just like when we hang out. (laughs) It's the same. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's really funny, man. It's, you know, they, they're there to keep us humble. Oh, totally. Oh, totally. <laughs> it's, yeah, it st- stops me from getting too, taking myself too seriously. Totally. It lets me laugh at myself. Yeah. And I can I can think God wants to use me to change the world. And she's like, yeah, go. Yeah, you <laughs> need to go to the grocery you. store. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. So you're here in Colorado. What's What's been something that's been surprising about your time in Colorado? What's been something you thought, oh, this is really cool. I didn't know people in Colorado did or that we've enjoyed. What's something surprising? I I think one of the immediate things that we came when we got here was it feels like everybody we meet feels ready to go on a hike. <laughs> <laughs> like even when people like would show up at church, it's like well, you, you look like you can go to the mountains after this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and everybody, I mean, yeah, it's. I mean, the, the people in Colorado, it feels like this has been, like, people just care so much about health and fitness. And it's a great thing. It's mm-hmm. just so, it's just so different yeah. than from, I mean, I mean, coming from the Midwest. And people, pe- I mean, people can't go outside in the winter. <laughs> <laughs> like, people think, mm. people think this winter is bad. And it's like, I, I, it just feels like a normal winter to me. Yeah, yeah. Totally. just normal with blue skies. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So Wait, you, if you didn't know, in the Midwest, you lose the sun for like three or four months. Oh, <laughs> man, that sounds miserable. Yeah. That just sounds awful. <laughs> okay, so there's something really interesting in your story. I think it's really just a wonderful part, and it contributes to the, the DNA of Calvary. But you... Your family comes from the Hmong 
right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. So ethnically, I'm Hmong. So what that means is uh, we're in a small ethnic group in Southeast Asia without, so without an actual country. So South China, Vietnam, Laos, Thailand, uh, my parents and my grandparents were all born in Laos and my parents uh, and my grandparents came over as refugees after the Vietnam war. So my parents were both little kids wow. and my grandparents were in their twenties when they brought their little kids over to America as refugees after the war and so one of the cool things last year, you know, and, and one of the coolest things that I think Calvary does is we work with the Afghan refugees mm -hmm. here in Colorado. And, you know, as we were praying together as a staff last year, I was realizing in like as we were praying, whoa, where I am, like w in my lineage is I am the f like the firstborn kid. Uh, to to those little Afghan kids, you know, you know, like those yeah. Afghan kids that come over as refugees. They don't really know what's happening. Parents are just bringing them to a new country. Don't really know exactly what they're running from. But now they're here. They're having to figure it out, and they grew up and they have kids, and that's me. Yeah, that's amazing, man. I love how God did that in your own story, just to help you process your own journey, your family story. That's really neat. Yeah, that's really neat. Yeah, I I think it's wonderful. I, you know, actually, I spent some time um, in Vietnam. So it's really close to Laos. I tried to get to Laos. I really did. Yeah. Just to knock it off the bucket list. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. But it is a wonderful, I spent time in northern Vietnam near the Chinese border. Met some Hmong. No way. In my time. Yeah. Um, you know, the, it's a ethnic minority. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty rare. Totally. Yeah. Um, but it was some of the most beautiful people in the world. Yeah. You know, just one of the unique experiences you have in your life yeah like do you go up into a Hmong village like in the mountains we did yeah we traveled from the north of hanoi all the way to the chinese border okay, over a few yeah. days mm -hmm. and we were part of a ministry at that time this is before 9 11 even yep um so i was a senior graduating senior in high school we were sort of the exploratory group to see how far the government would let us get into northern vietnam right and so we met people that had never seen white people before. Yeah. And, um, yeah, we, we visited a few minority people groups yeah. while we were there. Yeah. It was a yeah. beautiful experience. It's super remote. I mean, yeah. up there. I mean, there's Hmong, Hmong people, I mean, especially, but also those other small minority, mm -hmm. like Southeast Asian groups, I mean, are just tucked away into the mountains, mm -hmm. away from kind of the rest. I mean, and I mean, the story of Hmong people, and I'm sure of the other people groups, is... They're migratory groups where they go to new places and people don't want them. Right. And so they go and they make their villages and set up in the mountains. Yeah, and, totally. Yeah. Totally. That's part of their story. And yeah. Um, yeah, it's just a wonderful part of the world and wonderful part of the country with the sad, sort of sad history um, in our past. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Okay, let's jump in. We we were just in Luke 18 and um, some great preachers on all three campuses in Luke 18. Especially in the Erie campus. No, that's not true at all. <laughs> if you want to listen to someone great, you should go listen to Tom. <laughs> but, you know, Luke 18, we're sort of turning the corner, it seems like, from my reading, that we're turning the corner from sort of the finality of Jesus' ministry in Galilee, Capernaum, the regions of surrounding the Judean countryside and other places, right, northern and southern. And now Jesus is about to head this next week in Luke 19 into Jerusalem for his final week of life. As you were reading Luke with the church, what, what's sticking out to you, um, Solomon, with like what Jesus is doing or what is he saying that's really sticking out to you? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I mean, I... Th I I've been really challenged as I continue to read, I mean, as I continue to read the parables mm -hmm. and the, the way that Jesus is teaching and telling stories and in ways that it's so sometimes, I, I don't know if you feel this way, Jay, when it, but when I've been reading through Luke this time, mm -hmm. I've been kind of even confused. Like are, are his parables just feel so disjointed to me. Mm -hmm. It's like he's teaching about, He's, he's teaching about prayer and money or or hell and 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 then teaching about like like uh, telling all these different stories and I'm like wrestling of like how how are these things connecting and helping like um 
but then at the same time being being challenged and i've been I mean, i've just really been enjoying sitting underneath um the sermons this in this season to yeah. i mean especially there's thomas either last week or the week before uh, really unpacked uh and a really confusing story and parable in a way that that was super helpful right yeah no no, no doubt yeah i think that's really interesting because you know the back half between sort of luke 11 10 um and going into luke 18 there's a lot of what it looks like to be a disciple mm-hmm. what does the kingdom of god look like yeah. as well and i think it does get disjointed a little bit that's where i think um you know we're in the luke but also I teach a men's group that we're doing the harmonies of the gospels. Mm. So we're doing the chronological sort of story of Jesus through all four gospels. Wow. And yeah, scholars over the last hundred of years have put together these stories together so that you really get the whole breadth of like the three years of Jesus's ministry. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's helpful at times. Luke It gives you a landscape that, like, there's some stories that we miss out in Luke because the other Gospels tell them. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. And Luke is is an investigator of a specific account of Jesus through the eyewitnesses of Jesus. And what he wants to do is really tell you a cohesive story of, is Jesus who he said he is? You know what I mean? Totally. And so he doesn't add some of these stories that Matthew, Mark, or even John pick up on. Right. And... Vice versa. They don't pick up on some of the Luke stories. And I think your reading of like, it's like disjointed at times might be probably like the chronological, you know, we do, we're just not focused on that right now. Like, yeah. 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 That makes sense. Jay, I, I would actually be curious because you did something and you mentioned in your message that you, I mean, you got permission and it was kind of jokingly, but you preached the end of Luke 18 uh, with the story of Jesus healing the blind beggar at Jericho, mm-hmm. with Jesus meeting Zacchaeus at the beginning of Luke 19. I would be curious why, when you were preparing your message, why you decided, I need to preach these stories together. Yeah, you know, it really came out to, Thomas approached me to preach in Luke 18. He, he gave me some suggestions, and I was really drawn as I kept reading and praying over a few days of this blind beggar in Jericho. Mm-hmm. One, um, there's a few reasons why. Uh, one is that it was in Jericho, and that really caught my attention really early on because God's been d- up to something in Jericho for a very long time mm-hmm. with the, the even the lineage of Jesus coming through Jericho, Rahab. Right, yep. Um, a lady who Sting sang about, Roxanne, you know? A, yeah, yeah, yeah. red light lady. Uh-huh. Um, and her faith, as Hebrew says, um, is really commended. And it reminded me that God is about the nations um, and has been for a very long time. Yeah. And then I got to reading the text and I was like, wait a minute. Actually, this is where our chapters and verses fail us. These two stories are connected because they're in Jericho. Mm. Like I couldn't just preach one of them because they're both, the blind man and Zacchaeus happen in Jericho right before he gets through Jericho to go to the sermon, the triumphal entry right. to Jerusalem. Yeah. He's literally walking through the town maybe a day, maybe less than a day. Yeah. And then he's going to climb the road from Jericho to Jerusalem to the triumphal entry. He will tell a parable in Luke 19. Um, it's a very poignant parable um, on his way. So he's literally ascending climbing with his disciples i'm sure they're taking rest breaks because it's 18 miles uphill yep and it's hot arid it's not very much shady there's a lot of commerce on the city on this walk we know right and so i was really struck by that the jericho connection Mm. two things is also um the the men represent there's two different crowds there one's outside of jericho one's inside yeah um but they have two different reactions. One glorifies God from the blind man right. being healed. And the second is they grumble that Zacchaeus gets picked to Jesus to eat lunch at his house. Right. Mm-hmm. Maybe dinner, but I think it's probably lunch, midday right. type stop. Um, I think those are sort of why I kept. And, you know, like the other parts of 
Luke 18, and you should read them. I mean, there's some, the rich young ruler, children coming to him. Um, it's just really fascinating, great, the persistent widow of prayer. Yeah, the, that's actually one of my favorite parables in, of, about prayer mm-hmm. in, in that one. Yeah. But, J- Jay, I would, be, I would be curious, like, what things in your study that when, because, I mean, I know when you prepare a message, you're, you're, you have all this knowledge and wealth of riches that you've like seen and studied. And when you go to preach a sermon, you only get to give like the tip of the iceberg of the, all those things that you've seen. Uh, t- tell us a little bit about what stood out to you in your study that you didn't actually get to share with the people in your message. Yeah. Well, the another reason why I picked 18, because I thought I might talk about it, but I didn't end up. It wasn't part of the theme of the verses that we were going through. It's the phrase in which the blind man uses. He says, son of David, have mercy on me, a sinner. Mm. That phrase, as much as I can tell Solomon, is a prayer that the church has prayed as a prayer practice more and longer than they did even with Psalm 23. Mm. The Lord is my shepherd. Wow. So there's two prayers that the early church prayed. Um, that is the Lord's Prayer, obviously. Right. And the second one is this is son of David, have mercy on me, a sinner. And it was a prayer practice in which individuals, if you struggle with prayer, it's something you just say throughout the day. Mm. When, you, when you are aware that you need to pray, this is how you start. Mm. Son, of, son of David, have mercy on me, a sinner. Yeah, I, I would be curious, Jay, because um, I hear that, and I'm sure even some listeners hear that, mm. And we, we can pray like like Son of David or Jesus, have mercy on me. Like what are we asking for? Yeah, we're we're acknowledging our position, our real position in front of God. We're acknowledging that we are sinners and that there is a God of the universe who can step in and actually have mercy on us. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, And there's actually a famous text. There's a really famous, it's a really, um, about 1100 AD, about the the, um, son of David, have mercy on me, a sinner. It's about a pilgrim who learns this prayer and gives up everything in order to pray it in his journey through that. It's a beautiful text. Um, But, you know, those are things that I think, really stuck out to me. I'm a formation guy. Yep. You know, I love biblical theology. I love theology. I love, actually, I love the Gospels. That's where I have my majority of my studying career in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But when a formation, like that prayer, that's why I sort of picked that text. Mm. The other reason is, the other thing I left behind that I think is really interesting, like really interesting, and Thomas made this point a few weeks ago, but, when Luke names the individual in the Gospels, yep. he names a few, mm-hmm. just a few. He doesn't name all of them. Um, what he's doing is he, those individuals are still alive at the time that he writes Luke hmm. and Acts. And that is a way in which you can go and then go ask that individual if this is true. Does that make sense? Yep. Now, Zacchaeus is a fascinating story because honestly, the blind man doesn't have a name in Luke. He might have a name in actually some other Gospels. I won't go there. Yeah. But in Luke specifically, he doesn't have a name. And Zacchaeus does. And Zacchaeus has a name because it turns out from my study, um, R.C. Sproul says that, and I'll pull it up here, that um, the scripture is silent about the future of Zacchaeus. This is R.C. Sproul. But church history is not the Bishop of Alexander, Clement, he's a famous bishop, famous writer. He has some great writings. You can still buy his books, you know, like his writings of what early church father says in one of a few of his homilies says Zacchaeus is continued to live faithfully and grow and mature in the Lord and serves Christ to the end of his life. Um, even being, this is from Clement, even being ultimately given the role of bishop of Caesarea. So Zacchaeus becomes, so bishop back then means shepherd, pastor, like an overseer of a region. Right. Sort of the theological holder of actually 
Christianity. Does yeah. that make sense? It's not like bishops we see on in the Catholic Church anymore. Yeah, it's more of a it's a more of a pastoral role that Zacchaeus is actually given in mm-hmm. Caesarea. So I think that is fascinating that Zacchaeus has this moment with Jesus. He's the chief tax collector. He's super rich. He restores all his relationships, and then he ends up serving Christ and be eventually becoming a shepherd of God's people. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, like, you know, that's where it's great. The scriptures are exactly what you need to live your life. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. Yet church history is really important to read and study because you catch stories of like Zacchaeus like that. Yeah, or even the stories of how people have applied and lived out those scriptures in, in their life. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Totally. And and I, I would be curious, Jay, of after after you gave your message, what what is your hope for what people would walk away with in the next week after looking at the stories of the those two peop those two people in Jericho that meet Jesus? Yeah, man. You're interviewing me on the weekly. That's funny. Um, <laughs> it's the theme verse of uh, and I bet the those who preach Luke 19 this week will pick it up. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Yeah. He tells us exactly after the blind man and Zacchaeus in Jericho what he's about. And it's a theme verse of Luke. If you were going to say if there's one verse that defines Luke, that might be the verse. Mm-hmm. Usually it is by scholars as the theme verse of Luke. Jesus coming to seek and save the lost. But I think that's really important because so often we get distracted of actually why Jesus came. Sometimes we believe like Jesus came to like build a church, you right. know what I mean? Yep. Or he came to um, set a political agenda right. or he came to whatever, fill in the blank. Right. Um, and really what Jesus tells you is why he came. Yep. So the man came to seek and save the lost. Yep. And you read that through Acts and it makes, makes you feel, Make sure you get the picture of Jesus cleared back up yeah. into who he is and what he's about, even in your life. Yeah. You can ask this question, what is Jesus about in my life? He's actually about seeking and saving the lost around you. Yeah. That, like, that's a really important part of why you're here, why you live in the neighborhood you do, why you, your kids go to the same school, those the school, why you have the job you have, why you play pickleball. You know, totally. with your friend group. Yeah. If you're retired, e. Yeah. Like, Jesus is about seeking and saving the lost around you. Yeah. And um, I think that's just so important to remember. Yeah. And, and I mean, to encourage you, I had a conversation with, with a high schooler after the 9 a.m. And, you know, something cool that we're doing right now in, in the high school ministry is that each of the majority, like the major public high schools that make up uh, our high school community, mm-hmm. We have different student prayer leaders who are going to start weekly prayer meetings at their school, That's praying that God would would work in their school, that would use them, you know, like to, and, and I had a student who's, who's leading his first prayer meeting this week. Mm. And he came up to me and he's like, try th- thinking through how do we get more people and invite people to come and pray? And he's like, the message today reminded me that I could go and look for people who look lost, who are on the margins, and or like who sit by themselves, and I can go to them and be like, "Hey, do you want to come pray with me?" Yeah, totally. and, and and I think that speaks. I mean, kind of even getting at what what you're saying of like who Jesus is, which is I, w- I was encouraged yesterday. Yeah. You know, the thing about that is with that student is like you and I and those listeners will never hear those stories of how they stepped out in their faith yep. to invite those people, but Jesus is yeah. and doing it and providing and forming that high schooler through that process because he is passionate about people seeking and saving the loss. Yeah. You know, that's really cool. I, I can't wait for those prayer groups and to hear in the years to come the fruit in which the Lord has produced just by some students being faithful. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm so pumped. I mean, I, I'm praying that, that the work that we do at WNT. I mean, just launches them to see God work even in more powerful ways in the places that they spend most of their day. Yeah, man. I love this place because we are building Christ-centered communities 
Like it's what we are, we are passionate about, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. And part of that is making disciples and empowering them. Yep. And I love that W and T is doing that. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Keep up the good work. I, I appreciate it, Jay. I love getting to be here. Yeah, man. It's so good to sit down with you. Um, as we think about as people of Calvary, as we think about W and T student ministries, what are some ways in which we can pray as a community for uh, W and T for high schoolers, for middle schoolers, for students at Calvary? Yeah. What the, one value each year we kind of have a value or in a season we have a value that we're starting to get after. And in this season, one of the, the values that we're getting after is we want to be people who share the good news about Jesus. Mm-hmm. And so we're trying to help to create a space and a culture where our students are people who have eyes for their friends and their teammates and the people they work with that, that to be people who share Jesus with them. So, so you can be praying that the, that will start to just catch catch a fire in, in, in the hearts of our students, that we would be people who love people the way Jesus does. Solomon, I think we at Calvary would be honored to be praying with you over that. So Calvary, let's do that. This next season between here and Easter, let's continue to pray for student ministry and for our students to be bold in their faith, unhindered in their faith, and that they would, we would see some fruit from their hard labor. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Calvary. Thanks so much. Like always, you can write us at theweekly at calvarybible.com. We love to hear from you. Hit me up in the lobby. Hit Solomon up. Tell him how awesome he is and what he's doing here at Calvary. Also, aren't you just glad that the Lord is moving among us? He's alive and active today. And guess what? He's doing that exact same thing in your life. So we're praying for you as well. Have a great week.